eyes How is everyone doing? A little more enthusiasm. There we go. All right, we are back in the auditorium. And up next, we have Nathan Ingram. Please welcome to the stage. All right, how's it going this, uh, so far this morning? Everybody had a great WordCamp so far? All right. So how many of you are working with clients currently? Hey, guess what? You're in the right talk. Uh, how many of you are freelancers, solopreneurs, small type agency? Awesome. Okay, you guys are my crowd. So here's the thing. This is why this talk is so very important. I'm a passionate advocate for freelancers and business owners because I believe that freedom comes when you own your own business, control your time, control your life, control your own priorities. But here's what I've discovered over the years of doing that myself and in coaching people who are in that same situation. Many freelancers, many agency owners, WordPress businesses are one more bad client away from throwing in the towel. Have you ever been there? I have. And it's a shame because virtually all client problems can be mitigated or eliminated by systems and processes. And that's what we're going to talk about today. My name is Nathan Ingram. I'm from Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, the, if the accent hasn't given me away already, uh, I am the host at iThemes Training, where we do free webinars all year long, two or three free ones a week uh, online at uh, training.ithemes.com. It's like being at WordCamp all year. Uh, I'm a business coach for WordPress freelancers, and I myself have been a, a freelance or small agency owner since 1995, a long, long time. I'm also going to be the host of the WP Business Podcast, which is launching next month, which I'm pretty excited about. So I'm an expert, at least by the definition of Dr. Niels Bohr, who said an expert is a person who has found out by his own painful experience all the mistakes that one can make in a very narrow field. So by that definition, I am definitely an expert, and my goal in this talk is hopefully to save you the pain of having to remake the mistakes that I've made. Uh, so if you can pick up a few things in this talk that will make your client life better and avoid some of the pain that I've personally had to go through, then hopefully that'll be a success today. So here's the way the talk is going to break down. We've got 40 minutes and I've got a lot to cover. So we're going to talk first of all about friendly monsters and the concept of clients as friendly monsters. Then we're going to talk about four fences that you need to build by appropriate systems and processes in your business to keep those monsters fenced in. And then we're going to wrap up with that should actually say four. I had to drop one because of time today. But four monsters that you need to know and how to contain them using the strategies that we're going to talk about. Now, for those of you who like to furiously scribble, don't worry about it. Just go to nathaningram.com slash WCPHX, the hashtag for this event. You can download all the slides. There's other stuff there. And also, I just literally last week got the book for this presentation. So it's out there on Amazon as a printed book and a Kindle if you are so interested. But at that link, you can download the whole slide deck. So, you know, if, you, if you're scribbling, don't worry about it. Just download the slides. You got it. If you want to tweet at me, I am at Nathan Ingram, hashtag WCPHX. That'll be at the bottom of every slide. Okay, ready to go? Yeah. All right. So clients are friendly monsters. The problem is, and maybe you've experienced this in your working with clients, every client has the potential for transformation. Have you ever had that experience where, you know, you have that first initial meeting with the client? Maybe it's in your office if you have such a thing that you bring clients to. Maybe it's at a coffee shop. Maybe you go to the client's place of business. You have that first conversation. You're like, yes, this is a great client. It's going to be wonderful. And you get into the project. They hire you. You get about two weeks in. And all of a sudden, this whole other person appears, right? It's like, where did this person come from? Well, Every client has the potential for transformation. That's why we have this nice, you know, smiling monster. But if you'll notice very carefully, even friendly monsters have teeth. 
So we need to build fences in our business to protect us from these friendly monsters. These fences are good systems and processes. Because if you don't fence in the monsters, listen, you're going to waste time, you're going to waste money, and most of all, you're going to waste emotional capital dealing with the stresses that those monsters bring into your life. Does that make sense? All right, so here's the question for you. Do you have a consistent business system in the way you do your work? Do you have a way that you work every project, every client, every time? That's what I'm talking about. Because having that sort of consistency can really help you deal with the monsters. Now, the four fences I want to describe to you today are, first of all, clarity. We're going to go through each of these and spend some more time on them, but clarity... Then commitments, third, communication, and last of all, documentation. So those are our four fences, and they can look different ways depending on how you do your work, but these four fences have to be in place. And you may have additional fences, but these four are critical. If you leave off one of these fences, guess what the monster is going to do? They're going to wander out through that hole, okay? So clarity, commitments, communication, documentation. That's where we're heading in the first part today. By the way, I'm going to pause briefly between the first part here when we're talking about the fences, and uh, we'll take two or three questions right there, and then we'll have as much time as we have left for Q&A. This is usually an hour-long talk, and we have 40 minutes, so I'm going to try to compress. All right, so clarity. Clarity is important, and the first thing I want you to understand is that agreement does not equal clarity. Agreement does not equal clarity. In my experience, the most common reason that client relationships suffer is a lack of clarity. And don't confuse agreement with clarity. You can have agreement without clarity. The client can be sitting there shaking her head up and down and have no idea what it is that you're saying to them. This is particularly important in a technical field because you and I have a tendency, if you're like me anyway to all of a sudden get into some technical jargon. And that intimidates people. And sometimes they'll shake their head, yes, up and down like this so as to indicate an affirmative response, and they have no idea what you're talking about because they don't want to seem dumb, and they don't want to ask the question. So we have to work on getting to true clarity when we're dealing with the client. We can muddy the water with technical jargon. And sometimes, I'm not sure if you've ever experienced this, but sometimes (laughs) clients don't tell you everything right? Now, here's the question I want to ask you about that. When clients don't tell you everything about a project, whose fault is that? I hear some mine, I hear some theirs. I'd say it's at least 50-50, okay? It's at least half and half. Because you and I, as professional web developers, people working with clients, whatever it is you do in client services, We need to develop the skills of asking great questions. That is one of the most important soft skills that you can create, that you can develop if you're going to be working with clients. Drill down, drill down, drill down, drill down. Ask why, why, why. Keep getting to the root of the issue until you find absolute clarity. That one skill can set you apart from everybody else who's building websites for clients or doing whatever it is you do for clients. Getting to the root of the matter on all, everything about the project so you achieve clarity. And here's the thing about it. Once you really get to clarity with a client on a subject, it's, you realize it. You get there. You find it. So keep asking the questions. Agreement does not equal clarity. Second thing I'd like to mention is assumptions create confusion. When there's a lack of clarity, it's oftentimes because you're making assumptions or the client is making assumptions. What is the client assuming that you're going to do as part of the project? What are you assuming that the client will do as part of the uh, the project? And what you have to do is take a really hard look into your own process. How do I build websites? How do I do whatever it is I do for clients? What does that process look like? And where in that process are the assumptions made? either by me, that the client understands something, or by the client, that I'm going to do something. Where are the assumptions in your process? So we have to be specific. Be specific to create clarity. The key to clarity is specificity. And for this, your intake process is absolutely critical. 
It could start with a great intake form, which is a consistent list of questions that you ask for every client, every project, every time. Now, how many of you have that? You have got a list of questions literally written down somewhere. Okay, it's, that's actually more than most people in a room this size. Yeah, so a consistent list of questions. For years, here's what I did. We just started having a conversation, and I prided myself on this organic flow of discussion. And what would I do? I'd walk out, and I'd think, ah, I forgot to ask about something, right? And it was oftentimes one of the most important questions I should have asked. And it's because I didn't write it down. Now, why didn't I write it down? Because I thought I was smart enough to keep everything in my brain. And I've learned over time that I'm not smart enough to keep everything in my brain. So you make a freaking checklist. That's what you do. Pilots, when they take off in a plane, guess what they do? I don't care if they've been flying 30 years. The pilot of the air, aircraft is going to go down a checklist and do everything. One, just like that's what you do if you want great consistency. So it's got to start with that sort of thing. The form can be on your website. It can be something in a, you know, just a Word document or Evernote or whatever you want to use. But just make sure you ask the same questions every time. By the way, I have a whole other presentation about this. You can find it on WordPress TV called uh, Mastering the Client Consultation. If you want to look on WordPress TV, it's there from a couple of different WordCamps. Don't rely on your own memory. So one of the most important places this shows up is in the scope of work. If you think about the most common place that a client project falls off the, the rails when it comes to assumptions, what would you say? Where is a project always stalled in your experience? Ah, there it is, right there. Ding, ding, ding. How many of you get stalled on content? Oh, the client thought I was going to do it. I thought the client was going to do it. Nobody quite knows what's going on, and we have a lack of clarity, right? So those are the sorts of things that have to be included in your scope of work. You want to be crystal clear on who's doing what, okay? Your contract then also has to be clear on how your processes work and what happens in certain scenarios like when the client disappears for three months and you can't get a reply. What happens? In, I mean, nobody else has that problem, do they? Anybody? Yeah, so what happens in that? Are, are you just waiting forever on the client, or do you have something in writing that deals with that? What happens if the client doesn't pay? What happens if the project goes off the rails in the middle and you have to separate ways? What does a good divorce and a project look like? What are all the things? What do they mean? Are you baking in accessibility to all of your websites? Are you providing an SSL certificate? All the little nitty-gritty details you got to be clear about. Otherwise, you may find the client is assuming something, and they may think that you're going to, and it's a whole big mess. Be specific so that we know what we can expect from each other. You with me? All right. Second fence is the fence of commitments. This is, a, this is really important. How many of you have discovered that every single healthy relationship in life is built on a healthy commitment in some way between the people involved? I learned that in my marriage. I'll be married 25 years uh, very soon. When, that's this year. Yeah, 25 years this year. Uh, in June, in June, yeah, this is recorded, right? June 11th, I'll be married. Twi like my wife's ever going to watch this. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, and I, I've learned that a long time ago. It, it, you, you have to have great it's commitment levels that continues to be defined. But have you ever thought about the client relationship in terms of commitment? For years, here's the mistake that I made. For years, the commitment the client had to make to me was to sign the check. And I was so happy to get paid for what I love to do, I would just make everything else happen. And I would put on the superhero cape and just make it happen, right? I learned really quick that doesn't scale at all. You can do that if you're working with a client or two. You can't do that if you're working with 30 or 40 or 100. You can't do it. It's not possible unless you never want to sleep or never be able to speak to someone that you really like ever again. All relationships built on healthy commitments. The client needs to understand the commitments they're going to be asked to make as part of this project that you're involved in. So what you need to do is design a process that includes opportunities for the client to commit at key points. Now, I usually like to spend more time on this part in particular, but I'm just going to give you the nine phases of commitment in my process. This may not work for you, but it's an overview of the way I do things, and I like to have visuals. So this is the board game of a web design project. Anybody else have family game night when they were growing up? We did that. My kids won't do it, but um, I don't know. 
So this is the game of life, as it were, for a website project. And we're going to start out over here with first contact. When a client contacts me for the first time, uh, generally speaking, one of the first few things I talk about with them is a, is a minimum price. To work with us, the minimum that we charge for a website, no matter how small, is $4,500. That is the in-the-door price. De and depending on what you need, it's going to go up from there. They've got to commit to that introductory price before I'll spend any more time with them. How many of you have spent hours on the phone or in meetings with clients and you give them a proposal and they come back and they say, well, I thought it was going to be like $300. Yeah, I've wasted hours of my life with clients that way. So the, one of the first things out of my mouth now is it's a minimum price. And before we go any further, before I invest any more time with them, they've got to commit to at least that scenario. Does that make sense? That's how commitments flesh out like this. Then we move into an initial consultation. I don't even sit down across the table at Starbucks from somebody until they've agreed to that minimum price. Otherwise, you're going to waste a ton of time. So you move to this initial consultation. This is where you know, you're asking questions about what the project is going to look like and what it's going to include and you know, all their goals they're trying to reach. And you know, that's, you've got to have a great list of questions for that. We've talked about that. But at the end of that uh, meeting, I do something else that has to do with pricing, and that's it. I give them a ballpark price, usually within about a $1,000 range. And it sounds something like this. Based on the discussion that we've had about your website, this sounds like about a five dollars to $6,000 project. If I bring back a proposal to you tomorrow that's within that range, are you ready to start? I'm not going to spend two hours writing a proposal for a client until they commit to that price range. Why would I do that? Why would you do that? How many of you have wasted hours writing? Yeah, me too wasted hours writing proposals for clients and you're way off the target and this is what we do it's beautiful we'll sit there and we'll, we'll fiddle on price we'll go okay should it be $3,500 no 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 $3,700 no 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 $3,775 you've done that haven't you probably if, you know, we all tend to do the same things but yeah why spend that time why go through that grief until the client is at least bought into a ballpark price that's a whole discussion of its own all right, then the client signs your documents. They give you the check to start. Hopefully, you're getting at least half up front. Then we move into uh, the proposal and contract. They sign your documents. You've got a great contract that talks about all the phases of and what they're, what they're expected to do, what they can expect from you. They sign it. They give you the deposit. That's a huge commitment on their part, right? Huge commitment. Then we move in, and I ask them to do another piece of commitment, and that is the content. This is something I learned several years ago from a friend of mine who said this, no code before content. And I've changed it around, and I call it content first. Content first, content first. That means this. After we get the signed document, we'll give the client a content guide that will help them think through the content of their website. Or maybe as part of the project, we brought in a copywriter, or we're going to help architect what the content looks like. If it's a simple project, they can usually do it themselves, and we give them a workbook to work through those things. We don't move another inch, not an inch. For those in Europe, not a centimeter, until we get 100% of all the assets that are needed to build that website. That's content, photography, video. Because otherwise, here's what happens, and you've probably done this. You, uh, one day, they send you the text for the About Us page, and so you build that. And oh, three weeks later, you get the pictures of the CEO they finally had time to get. And then all oh, the next week, it's the pictures of the staff. And you're still waiting on that product, the number three product, and you can't ever get that description from them. Does that sound familiar? And you've three months long now, right? And it takes you forever. You got to go in, say something, you got to get out and go in and get out and go in and get out. How quickly could you build a website if you sat down with 100% of the assets? You could get it done in a week, probably, right? If it was a simple website. So why not do that? It's your process, it's your business. Make it that the way you do things. I'm so stupid, it took me 20 years to figure that out. Content first. Okay, so then we move in, once we get all the, uh, the content, we move into the design phase. The client has made huge commitments. They've given us all the content that we need. We move into design phase where we actually build the design of the site, looking at all the content they have. And we, I still do a flat graphic design because I think it's easier for clients to visualize that way. Uh, and they, we, don't, we stop right there. We don't do any development until they approve the design because what I don't want is, hey, let's change all the colors three days before we launch, right? By the way, never try to design before you have content. If you're hitting a wall on design, most design problems are content problems. If you have the content, you can figure out how to design it to make it look right and present. 
don't get the cart before the horse. Okay, so we give them the design, they sign off on the design, then we go into the cave and do development. Uh, and that takes however long it takes. Uh, that's our big commitment back to them. There's nothing they need to do at that point until the next phase, which is review and testing, where they get to look at the actual working website and make us a whole bunch of list of stuff they want to change and whatever. And we're testing it out on different platforms and browsers and mobile devices and all of that. Once they sign off on the finished product, we move into launch, where they give us the last big commitment, which is the final check, and we like that. Uh, so see, do, you, do you see through this process, it's back and forth. It's commitments. It's back and forth. It's not we pay you, you go do it, unless you're charging a lot of money. It's back and forth. Healthy relationships based on healthy commitments. Then we move into a maintenance phase where they're paying us every month to manage the website and keep it healthy. So in, in, in uh, your contract, when you're talking about the commitments, you need to clearly define the expectations and consequences. What can you expect of us? What can we expect of you? And what happens if one of us doesn't deliver? That's got to be part of your contract. And here's the thing. You can, and this gets into more of the clarity piece and how it works in with these commitments. You can't just expect that the client is going to read the contract and they'll sign the contract a lot of times without reading it, which is foolish, but guess what? You have a signature but no clarity. That's great in a court of law. It's terrible when you're trying to work with a client on a website, which means as you're going through the process, you need to remind the client of the commitments they make and what you're going to do and back and forth. You have to keep the communication going. That's actually the next point. But here's what I've learned. You can tell some clients thing, uh, something a hundred times but some clients don't stay told. Have you met that client before? Yeah, so you have to keep on with the communication. That's our next fence. Communication is critical. The third fence to keep those friendly monsters contained. It's my favorite quote about communication from George Bernard Shaw, who said the biggest single problem in communication is the illusion that it has occurred. And that's so true. If you're married, you know that. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, my wife's not going to watch this. Uh, but here's what I've learned over the years, and that is few things can improve the client's experience more than clear, regular communication. This, in my experience, is hard for those of us who tend to be people who build websites for clients because we like the code, not the people in general. And you may identify with that remark. But clear, regular communication is one of those things. It's another one of those soft skills. And even if you're not a people person naturally, most people tend to be skill-oriented or people-oriented. You're a doer or you're a people person. Rarely do the, can the same person do both. And that's okay. Just whatever you are, own it. And if you're not a people person, then develop some processes that at least check the boxes on communication and approach it like a task and not like people. Does that make sense? If you do that, it's going to set you apart. It's like asking good questions. It's another one of those things. So here's what I've learned. Without regular communication, clients will make assumptions. And usually they assume the worst. Here's one of the places where it comes out a lot of times. How many of you have been in the middle of a project and you hit some snag and it's taken you forever to figure that out? Some technical hurdle or there's something you're worried, right? And the last thing you want is for the client to call you and ask how it's going. Because then you have to admit that you don't know everything, which is a fallacy, by the way. Who knows everything? That's another talk. How many of us, when we hit a snag like that, we go down in the hole, we go hide in a cave, and we go radio silent with the client? That is such a mistake. It's such a mistake. Because what happens is you get two weeks up and you finally figure it out. Now you're two weeks behind. The launch date's probably going to be delayed. It's a terrible situation. So here's one of those processes. Now, if you're a people person, you can usually make the call and, oh, you can schmooze and it's all okay. And the clients love you anyway. It's, it's going to work out and be fine. If you're not, here's a process you can follow. It's what I call the Friday email strategy. Friday afternoon, before I finish the week, I send an email to every client of every active project that we're working on. It's generally three sentences. It takes just a couple of minutes for each client, but it's some of the best minutes a week that I spend it's the Friday uh, email, and it basically focuses on past, present, future. Past. Mr. and Mrs. Client, this is what we did on your project this week. That's the past. Present. This is where we stand in relationship to the completion of the project. Future. This is what we're going to be working on next week, and if you have any questions, please let me know. 
Now, how easy is that? And how great is it for the client to get that regular communication? It's wonderful. Now, this is the place also to communicate if you've got a problem. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Client, this week we experienced an issue getting the stupid API to connect to UPS to get live shipping rates. We anticipate getting that thing figured out for next week, uh, and we don't anticipate this impacting the launch date of your project. If you have any questions, please let us know. Don't over-communicate, don't overshare, but it's good to let the client know what's going on. Communication is critical. All right, last fence, then we'll stop for a minute and take some questions. Documentation. Documentation. If you aren't documenting your communication with the client, you are relying on your own memory or, at worst, the client's. Get used to communicating with the client in writing. Even if you do one-on-one -on -one meetings. By the way, that's what I usually do. One of the reasons I charge a premium for the web development projects that I, that I take on is that I meet with the clients face-to-face. -face. The clients that I work with value that sort of relationship. But after every single one-on-one -on -one meeting or video call or, or phone call, I send a follow-up email documenting what we just talked about. And it goes in the client's records. Why? Because written communication is referenceable. And if you ever have a disagreement with a client, you point back to that email on Tuesday afternoon at 2.36 p.m. and say, this is where we talked about this. And this is where we agreed. If a decision is made verbally in a call or in a meeting, email the client to summarize the decision. Don't even ask for a response, but you're sending the email to just validate, this is what we talked about, this is what I understood, and if I'm wrong, please correct me. Documentation is critical. Now, not only that, but you need to implement some sort of a system that's going to easily capture all your project communication. There's tons of tools out there, Basecamp, Teamwork, Evernote, Asana, some CRM, Trello. Don't just use email because you'll never be able to find it when you need it. Have some sort of a system where you're going to track all this project uh, client communication. Last thing I'll share is this. The best system to do this is the one that you will consistently use. There's a million options. Don't geek out on this. Just pick one and stick with it, will you? Because that's what I do too. I have like 50 things and I never make a decision. Or worse, this is a story that I hear about some of us who would self-identify as a geek. Uh, we will spend six months researching the perfect solution, or worse, building our own solution, and never use it, right? Don't do that. Pick one, use it, stick with it. Just use it consistently. It's never going to be perfect. But if it's there, it's there. Does that make sense? Okay, so clients are friendly monsters, four fences, clarity, commitments, communication, documentation. One more little point before we get to the uh, maybe two or three questions about this part, and that is this. Don't tear down your own fences. And you might think, why would I ever do that? Let me tell you, I've been coaching WordPress freelancers for almost five years now. Uh, I have hundreds of conversations every year with people working with clients. It's one of the, my favorite things that I do. I, I spoke last year at 19 WordCamps. I'll do probably more this year. Talking to freelancers. And I, I'm here because I want to help you do better in business. Here's what I've learned. We will spend the time to build these fences. Clarity, commitments, communication, documentation. We invest the time and the effort. And then here's what's going to happen. You let a client... Uh, so, some situation arises where the client wants to break through one of the fences that you've built. And because you're a nice person, in the back of your mind, you start making excuses for the client. Oh, it's not that bad. Oh, I'll just do it this once. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. And you let the client out of the system that you've built. And this is what happens, because it happens to me. Maybe it happens to you. This is what at least happens to me. For the first five minutes, I'll feel great about it. And I'll pat myself on the back. What great customer service I've just provided. We are, we are, you know, we are being flexible to meet the client's needs. And there's a technical term for that. It's called BS. <laughs> because this is what happens. About five minutes after you start feeling good about it, this little piece of resentment starts building. With the laughter, I think some of you understand what I'm talking about. 
And that resentment starts to grow. It's like this fire that lights, right? And it starts to grow and burn, and it gets bigger. And by the end of the day, for me at least, I still work from home, I'm walking up the steps, and I'm just in a mood. And I snap at my wife, and I mean to my kids, and I yell at the dog. Man, the dog got a response, not my kids. You know, that's <laughs> funny. Um, <laughs> look. Our tendency, this is especially important if you're a nice person. You can hold the client to his or her commitments and still be a nice person. Don't let the client weasel out of the commitments that they've made because then you start getting resentful that leads to frustration, that leads to anger. And this is the insanity of all of this. We are willing to let a stranger get out of the commitments that they already made to us in our business and instead be mean to all the people who are closest to us in our life. That is insanity. So don't do that. Don't tear down your own fences once you build them. Does that make sense? Okay, let's take two or three questions right here. Uh, Where are we on time? Right now? Okay, no questions. I have 10 minutes left. Okay. All right, by the way, uh, after lunch, lunch is out this way. Get your lunch, meet me outside the doors. If you're a freelancer working with clients, let's talk clients, okay? I'm here all weekend, I'm here for you. All right, five monsters you should know and how to contain them. It's actually only four. We may only get to two. We'll see how we go here. But the first is this. It is the invisible man. And you know you meet the invisible man when you express interest and they express interest and then they disappear all of a sudden. Does that sound like something? You like you get the meet and all of a sudden you can't find them. They're gone. Poof. They've disappeared. They, re- they schedule meetings and then reschedule meetings. They take a long time to respond when at first they were right, right on it. So what I've learned about this particular client, these are usually business owners or busy professionals. They're well-intentioned. They want a website, but they're just busy. And today, when the first time they talk to you, the website is a priority because none of their other 10 priorities are competing with it on that day. But then when you try to get back to them, one of their other 10 top priorities has taken its place and you'll never get them. Now, the website at that moment for them is not the top priority. The problem with these folks is they tend to disappear and reappear during a project with unreasonable demands. This is when I say the invisible man turns into the stealth bomber and they just appear. Poof, you've had this project for three months. Why isn't it finished? Boom, 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 drop bombs all over your world, right? I need it done this week, right now, right now, right now. This person can be a very difficult client to work with, right? This is where you focus on clarity. you got to make sure the client understands your processes, and you need to create a process for disappearing clients. Uh, in my contract, it says, look, if you go silent on this for 30 days, your project is suspended, and before we do anything else on it, we need 100% of all the assets and the rest of the project payment in full before we pick up your project and do anything else with it. If you go 60 days past that, your project is abandoned and that's it. You've lost your deposit. Why? Because I've had too much time wasted by invisible men and women. This is gender neutral clients, right? There's no face there. All right. By the way, this is where the Friday email comes in. We still haven't heard from you. If this goes another week, your project is considered suspended according to the terms of the contract. Okay. Also, yeah, clear wording in your contract to describe those things. Um, got to keep moving here. Oh, this is something I've learned. Very important. you got to communicate when a project is stalled with an invisible man because the longer a project takes, the more likely it is to go off the rails. They're going to forget what they talked about, and now their, priori- their priorities have changed. So you got to keep the commitment going. Okay, no, and then the second client monster is the question mark. The question mark has no idea what he or she wants, or they want everything. They ask endless questions. They have no goals or budget. How many of you have spent two or three hours in the first meeting with a question mark and you know exactly what I'm talking about and they just ask questions, 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 hundreds of questions, more questions. They love their ideas, their stream of consciousness. and it, ooh, ah. These clients are classic time wasters. This is the one where you focus on commitment because if you're trying to be nice to a question mark, they will let you waste your life on them. You will get nothing else done this week because you're answering emails that are five paragraphs long that they're asking questions and questions and questions. you got to focus on commitment quick. This is where the intake form is important, uh, where you're asking specific questions in a client interview and get to price early. My minimum price is blank. You're talking about a project that sounds like blank because I've learned that the quickest way to silence a question mark is with a dollar sign. Did you get that? 
The quickest way to silence a question mark is with a dollar sign. And if they insist on asking all those questions, that's when you move to a discovery phase where you help them answer all those questions and you get paid for it. Here's a good rule of thumb. Questions that you'll answer for those folks, the um, what questions are free, how questions cost money, how questions are intellectual property. That's a good rule of thumb. Okay, I got five minutes. Boundary Buster. This is the one, maybe you've met this one. They send a 3 a.m. email with a 7.30 a.m. follow-up. Why haven't you gotten this done yet? They always have to meet after hours or on weekends. They work on holidays. They expect you to. So when you meet one of these kinds of clients, they are these ones really get under my skin. Focus on communication. you got to focus on this is when I work, this is how I work, normal business hours, not weekends, not holidays. Man, i got so many things to say about this, and I can't do it. This is the one. Don't, don't ever violate your boundaries with this one, or they will take advantage of it. They are an excellent candidate for what I call the PETA surcharge. You know what that is? Pain in the asterisk. And if you're going to work with them, it's going to be worth it. It's going to cost more. Okay, last one, and we're, uh, we'll maybe have one minute for question. Again, gender neutral. I've met plenty of drama kings out there, but I had the, the picture for this one. So this is a drama queen. This is uh, one of the people that uh, one of my coaching clients calls her diva client. She works with yoga studios. God bless her. And Okay, I'm not saying, I'm just saying, I hear a lot about these. So this is the one who worked with a previous developer who did everything wrong. Have you ever met that one? Everything's an emergency. The favorite word is now. It's got to be done now, 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 now. And the other developer just couldn't get things right. Now, look, I've been around long enough to realize that in our field, there's a bunch of knucklehead web developers. If you ever inherited a project from somebody and you're like, what, what, why, what would possess any rational human to do things this way, right? Okay, so th we got, th that exists. However, as soon as a client starts complaining about the previous web developer, it's full stop. And I'm going to ask, 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 because it could very well be the client's the problem, not another developer. And if I don't weed that out early, then this, per, this client is going to be sitting across from some other poor schmuck six months from now complaining about me. All right, so we got to weed these drama queens out and kings. So here's what you do. You focus on documentation, hold into the commitments that they make because it's documented system trumps drama. Drama goes away when you hold into the black and white of the things they've committed to, and it's documented right there. So you got to keep careful, careful records when you deal with that client. All right, clients are friendly monsters. Sorry, that was really fast. This book, by the way, has narrative on all of the, there's like, it's the first half of the book is these friendly monsters, and it's like, here's a web developer who encounters one of these, and now they're talking to their business coach about it. It's pretty fun. But uh, clients are friendly monsters. It's clarity. Commitment, communication, documentation. Today, if I had to ask you, how strong are your fences in your business? How strong are your fences today? How much better would your life be if you had a good fencing strategy in place? Because good fences make great clients. My name is Nathan Ingram. You can find me at uh, nathaningram.com slash WCPHX. There you'll find the slides, other resources, etc. And listen... I'm here for you this weekend. I'm dead serious about that. Let's have lunch after. Let's talk about anything business related. I came to Phoenix from Birmingham for you to have those conversations. So uh, I think we're out of time, aren't we? No, we have three, minutes. three minutes. One question. Who's got it? First hand up wins. Right there in the front. Before we go to the first question, do I have a mic? Is my mic on? Is the mic on for the questions? Um, burning valuable seconds now listen i'll stay it, but lunch is there it's going to still be there but if you want to talk i'll be right here so the best place to learn more about this talk where would it be okay uh best place to learn more about this talk so this is part of a course that's on my website at nathaningram.com it's a process course that helps you build all those things sample contracts sample proposal all, everything the book is on amazon kindle and printable uh, or just come talk to me y'all uh, that's why i'm here so in your in your process um, I usually do the proposal um, so I can show the value before I give the price. So how are you showing the value immediately when you sell, tell your price before you do the proposal or anything like that? Okay, so uh, that's a great question. All right, so if your do, proposals don't sell, you do. Take all, you you want to make your world a lot easier, take all the sales crap out of your proposal. Proposals should contain a scope and a price. Because if you hand a client a 10-page proposal, what are they going to do? Page 10. They're, oh, there's the price. Why spend all that time? Right? Proposals don't sell, you do. So I do the selling and value in person.
And I work exclusively by referral anyway, so they're, they understand my value coming in. So for you, that might work. I'm just saying it's better if you're working by referral and they're asking to work with you rather than you having to prove your value to them. Uh, but if you need to prove value, do that verbally. Don't do it in your proposal. Or have some sales collateral that you can leave with them. Uh, but in that first presentation, what I'm trying to do is, is avoid spending two hours, three hours, creating a proposal that's long and fitted to their... All, until they're at least bought into a ballpark price. I've, I've wasted hours of my life. Yeah. Well, what, okay, one more question. Right over here. Keep you from walking. Thank you, guys. And I'm sorry for talking so fast. I just wanted to get it all in. No, thank you. Um, so what, and you may have resources for this, but transitioning to this system with current clients, or do we consider current clients kind of like moot, and then this goes for the new <laughs> <laughs> Okay, my current clients are terrible. How do we get into better clients? That's a great question. So how do you transition? You can, so what you have to be careful of is they haven't committed to anything, but you can start changing your habits and just say, this is the way I'm working, and subtly, passively train your existing clients toward this, but with the very next new client, you start the system. Yeah, it's a great question. There's probably a longer answer to that we could get into later. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, everybody. Lunch is being served outside. Um, we are currently not allowed to bring lunch into the convention center, so we do have to eat outside. Um, I'll be standing right outside those doors if you get your lunch and want to talk. Yeah. And then after lunch, we will be back in here. I lose my assistance.